All right, wait, wait, Matt, before, before you do anything, I, I don't want to do this shit. Let me make a call. Project Entertainment Network. This is Armand. Hey, man. Hey, dude, what's up? Uh, I quit. (laughs) You quit every week. (laughs) No, I'm, I'm, I'm serious this time, man. I've been working on this cheesing crap for the past eight days, Armand. I haven't gotten any writing done. My inbox has over 2,000 unread emails. I've talked to over 100 people, 100 people in the last week. I didn't even think cheesing published 100 people, but I've talked to 100 people. Half of them had valuable information. The other half were idiots. What do you mean, like John Delarose idiots, or no, like Mr. Keen? I'm not an author, but I read a cheesing book one time, and it had a typo on page fifty-seven, and I demand you interview me for an hour about it. Or, uh, hey, I've never listened to your show, but I hear you're working on the cheesing story. Can you tell me all about your show and why I should listen? Can you be Google for me? And I am tired of this bullshit, Armand. So I quit. And I know I've told you before, but I mean it. Find somebody else to do it. I don't care who. It can be the horror show with Nicholas Pashone at this point, for all I care. I'm out. You can't quit. Why? And I'm going to tell you why. AdamandEve.com are really happy with the success you've been having. Every time someone uses the offer code K-W-E-N-E at checkout, and they get those 10 free tantalizing gifts. And you know what that means? Uh, more money for me? Uh, well, no. More money for me. But... It means next year you'll get access to dozens of adult film stars. Define access. Brian, you'll have adult film stars visiting the studio so you can interview them every week if you want. And all because people are shopping at adamandeve.com and entering Keen at checkout. Okay. Adult film stars here in studio. I'll have access to them. Yes. All right. That changes my perspective. Talk to you later, dude. No comment. Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- what part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by Armand Rosamilia at the Project Entertainment Network and available for free, always free, on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play Music, and all other platforms. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. With me, as always, sitting to my left, author Mary San Giovanni. I am not amused by your nonsense. It's not my nonsense. That's our boss, baby. It's adamandeve.com. Our biggest advertiser. We we have to we have to do what they want. And of course, sitting to my right, let's get his reaction. Author Matt Wilderson. Oh right. <laughs> so you're you're down with this this change of format next year. I mean, regardless if I am or not, I have to record this, so I'm just gonna be here, right? <laughs> will, will, we, will we still call it the horror show, or will it in fact be the the adult entertainment show with Brian Keene? Oh my. <laughs> See now Mary's excited about it. <laughs> now she's okay. Um before we get, we we are in fact going to talk about cheesing, and we're going to talk about Stephen Jones and all kinds of things. But before uh. we get to that, uh, in addition to our good friends at AdamandEve.com, remember enter my last name at checkout and get ten free tantalizing gifts. I also want to tell you about the latest from USA Today best-selling author Robert Swartwood, uh, the much anticipated thrilling conclusion to the Man of Wax trilogy is up for pre-order right now. It's called Endgame. Uh, as I said, it's up for pre-order on Kindle, Nook, 
Kobo, iTunes, which is now Apple. I think they call it Apple Books now. I think um, so. And Google Play. Uh, it's available in all those formats. That's Endgame, the much anticipated final book in the Man of Wax trilogy. I should also mention the prequel to the trilogy, Legion, uh, is currently available as a free ebook on all of those platforms as well. So we thank Rob for sponsoring this week's show. We thank adamandeve.com. Now, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome. <laughs> Let me briefly tell you what we do here on this show, okay? Um, every week, we've been on the air five years. We're approaching our sixth year next February, okay? Every week, we feature interviews with the biggest names in the horror genre, actors, authors, editors, directors, musicians, video game makers, comic book artists. Adult film stars. Uh, next year, adult <laughs> film stars. Um, we also feature news for both industry professionals and fans. Sometimes that news is serious. Uh, and when it is, we strive to treat it seriously. We have a lot of fun on this show. Okay. But the fact of the matter is, Mary and I, between the two of us, have 45 years of experience in this field between the two of us. Wow, we're pretty impressive. Well, it's 25 years for me <laughs> and 20 years for you. Put it together. Right, That's right. 45 years of experience. Uh, you know, and we do this because there were professionals we looked up to that fought for us, fought to make the industry better. And we do it for people like Matt, who's starting out in this industry. Um, Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I thought he, welcome, I thought he was going to do it in the Alex Jones impression voice. And <laughs> oh, I, I'm sending like, psychic messages. No, while. not and don't do it today. It's too oh. serious today. Okay. <laughs> My point is, if the news is serious, we treat it seriously. This is important, new listeners. Listen closely. We report facts as facts. We report allegations as allegations. And we express opinion as opinion. And we will do so today as well. As I said, we're going to talk about Cheezine Publications, Canada's premier horror fiction publisher. We're going to talk about their owners, Sandra Casturi and Brett Savory. Uh, tangentially, we're also going to talk about Michael Rowe, Stephen Jones, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and if you're one of the people just tuning in to hear the Stephen Jones commentary, I mean, you can fast forward to the end of the show because that's where it's going to be, but you're going to miss a lot of good stuff. So I would ask you to to hang out with us just put us on in the background uh maybe get laid with us in the background and if you do consider first going to adamandeve.com and entering keen at checkout um and take it seriously yeah now that okay <laughs> now every, we've all got we've sense. all got our jokes out now right i mean i can't promise that all but right. i'll try my best <laughs> all right. um two disclaimers before we begin disclaimer number one i have known brett savory since 1988 or excuse me, 1998 or 1999. Um, I, I don't consider Brett a close friend in the way I would, you know, Jeff Cooper or the dearly departed J.F. Gonzalez and Tom Pick, really, or, or even Mary. Um, but I certainly consider him a friendly acquaintance. Um, you know, I, I've always been on good terms with Brett. I get along with Brett. I like Brett. Uh, if you look over there, on the wall, right above the door, that picture on the left, that's me and Brett and the aforementioned Coop and Jack Herringa and Ryan Harding and Rain Graves, a bunch of us, uh, in 1998, I think it was, at a World Horror Convention, okay? I've known Brett since the beginning of my career. He, he and I started our careers at the same time. Um, disclaimer number two. Uh, all of these allegations came to light over the past two weeks. However, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, the horror show of Brian Keene has actually been looking into this since October of 2018, last year. Uh, last October, several authors approached Mary and I off the record about cheesing publications. At the time, they were alleging late royalty payments, uh, late royalty statements, uh, no payment at all, no statement at all. Uh, we began looking into it, but we were then advised that the HWA Grievance Committee were also looking into it. Before we had gathered all the facts, which is what we do before we report on a story, 
uh, the authors who had come to us were all paid. Okay. At that point, we thought, all right, like just about any small press, you know, next week we're going to have Richard Chismar of Cemetery Dance on. Cemetery Dance has been around 30 years. They're very successful. But there have been times where it's tough to make ends meet and payments go late. And Rich is going to talk about that. Okay. It happens. It happens to every small press publisher sooner or later. We thought, okay, well, this was a case of that. And now it sounds like uh, Brett and Sandra are, are paying everybody. So we thought that was the end of the story. We were wrong. Um, last week. Author Ed Kurtz stepped forward, alleging that Cheezine withheld payments from him, refused to revert the rights to his book, and engaged in a campaign of personal and professional harassment against him. This led to a level of discussion in the industry that I have not seen the likes of since the collapse of Leisure Books. Mary, would you concur? I, I would concur, yes. Um, it, it reminds me very much of Leisure's collapse. Except I... Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. We're going to parse it for you today as best we can. We're going to parse it in order so that everyone understands the timeline. Again, we will report facts as facts, allegations as allegations, and opinions as opinions. Um, we begin with Ed Kurtz, who posted on his patron. Uh, as I'm sure most of you have noticed, there hasn't been much in the way of new content here uh, there's two reasons for this, neither of them good. One is I haven't written a word since spring, and I have no plans to do so in the foreseeable future due to my severe depression and anxiety. The other concerns a slimy Canadian publisher of mine that is engaged in a widespread attack on me and my character, effectively killing my career in the small press and marking me persona non grata, all because some of their key authors tricked me into taking the lead on getting us all paid. Some of us hadn't been paid in years and then threw me under the bus, denying all involvement and treating me like some dog shit they scraped off their shoes. So even if I did write, who would publish it anyway? Um, he then goes on to thank, you know, some people and he says goodbye. Uh, now, it's, you know, clear there. He does not name cheesy in the right. post. Um, and I, although I, I. I, I, I guess I am sure. I guess it is a fact. He's referring to what we were talking about previously, the HWA Grievance Committee, um, and that Cheezine paid people. Uh, I did not know that Ed felt this way afterward until this post was brought to my attention. Uh, even though he did not name Cheezine, Cheezine responded publicly to him, writing on their Facebook page. Given the recent discussion on social media about our professional relationship with author Ed Kurtz and other authors, we feel some of the misstatements that have been made need to be corrected. In 2018, Ed approached us asking about monies due him from a Russian translation of his novel. At the time, we told him the monies had not yet been paid to us, and we checked with our foreign rights agent who confirmed that they had received no monies either. We did not receive the translation right monies until late April of 2019. Once we received the translation monies, we paid Ed within 48 hours. Earlier this year, put a pin in that one, San Giovanni, we were approached by the Horror Writers Association to mediate the situation, and we do acknowledge that Ed's author royalties were late at that time, which we regret, and which situation was corrected promptly. Cheesing Publication remains a small press run by two people, Put a pin in that. And while we do our best to stay on top of the business, we occasionally fall short. Another pin. If your lips are getting tired, Matt can take over for okay. pinning. Okay. <laughs> this is not something we take lightly. Our author relationships are important to us. Ed Kurtz's royalties are currently paid in full. Any other monies he might be due will be paid on his next royalty statement, which will be in spring 2020. Big pin for that one. <laughs> nice pinning. As to an accusation that we, along with other small presses, attempted to blacklist Ed Kurtz or threaten him in any way, that is categorically untrue, and we deny it. We were proud to publish Ed's novel, and we were eager to publish his next one as per our contract option, but when he wished to withdraw that novel, we respected his wish. At no time has Ed ever asked for a rights reversal, although, of course, he's entitled to do so. We're happy to revert his rights if he makes that request. 
We are aware that this discussion is brought to light instances of late royalty statements or payments, and we believe it is important to address this with our authors. Accordingly, over the next four to six weeks, we will be reviewing our financials and reaching out to our authors and or their representatives to ensure that royalties are up to date and promptly address any shortfalls. If any of our authors have any specific questions, whether regarding royalty statements or any other business-related concerns, please contact us. Okay? Okay. Actually, just put a pin in that whole thing. That's a lot of pins. There may be need for a lot of pins. Ed Kurtz responded publicly on Facebook. The statement from Cheezine neglects a number of salient facts, such as the moment in July 2018 at Nikon when I explained to Brett Savory that my partner was facing a layoff Our cat was ill, we were in severe financial distress, and I had never been paid a single cent of royalties in what was at that time almost two years. I love the reply he got. (laughs) uh, Just go ahead. For a moderately successful book. He actually grinned and said, things are hard for everyone right now before walking away. The following morning, it was reported to me that Sandra was loudly complaining in the dealer room about me having asked about my royalties. And of course, the two of them went on a whirlwind trip around the world a few weeks after that, showing us all that things weren't so rough for them after all. In fact, I'd asked after my royalties several times and was rebuffed or given excuses every single time. Usually something was wrong with their accounting software or something similar, which I later learned they'd been saying to other authors for years. I only went to the HWA after several other frustrated authors, one of whom hadn't been paid in five years, strongly encouraged me to do so. I expressed fear of bullying and or retaliation. Some of those authors promised me they'd have my back. They didn't. And yes, a lot of us got paid through my efforts, though it is untrue. I'm paid in full. I was never paid royalties for the months of my first year of publication, 2016, though Cheezine continues to claim I was. Uh, As for bullying, blackballing, I'd call the half dozen people who refused to acknowledge my existence at Nikon 2019, and since then, just that. Some of these people I once called friends, they know who they are, they can keep their excuses and apologies to themselves. Uh, This behavior has wrecked my mental health, driven me from the writing community, and killed in me any last vestiges of my desire to continue writing at all. All right. That's right. Jesus. That is um, a lot. It's a lot, okay? And we're just at the start of the show. So But wait, there's more. Let's just the, let's okay. recap. Let's recap. So far, okay, let's take ourselves and our own emotions and feelings out of the situation. So far, this seems like a back and forth between two aggrieved parties. It's a right. he said, she said situation. Yes. All right. It's a lot of allegations, no facts. So we decided to dig into it further, and we discovered a lot of things. Now we will begin pulling those pins, San Giovanni. Okay. Uh, <laughs> like grenades. It is our opinion. Let me stress new new listeners that yes. word, opinion. It is the opinion of the horror show with Brian Keene that Cheezine's public statement in response to Ed Kurtz's allegations is deeply disingenuous, factually wrong, and a load of horse shit. Uh, let me parse it for you. Okay. Cheezine said earlier, earlier this year, we were approached by the Horror Writers Association to mediate the situation. That is factually inaccurate. They were approached by the HWA in the fall of 2018. And as I said at the start of the show, multiple sources discussed it with us in October of 2018 and told us at that time, HWA. Right. Was talking to Cheesy. Okay. So that is factually inaccurate. Cheesy says, while we do our best to stay on top of the business, we occasionally fall short. Once again, disingenuous, factually inaccurate. The horror show has confirmed that at the time of Ed Kurtz's grievance filing with the HWA, there were over a dozen authors who had not seen a royalty statement or any money owed for three plus years that's not one author that's over a dozen authors that's not occasionally falling short that's negligence at best theft at worst the optics were pretty terrible too considering as ed points out during that time while they weren't paying people 
they did, in fact, buy a new house and went on a lavish vacation to Europe, which they said was the honeymoon they never got to have. Uh, one source, speaking on condition of anonymity, told us, I went unpaid for years until I signed on to Ed Kurtz's letter demanding payment. Then last autumn, I got a check and a promise of at least a royalty statement in the spring after an audit. Nothing has been forthcoming, however. Several sources told us that Cheezine breached the contract even before their books came out. Uh, for example, opting not to publish a hardcover edition, even though that had been agreed upon in the contract. So, Matt, let me break that down for you. Um, what's your latest book? Horrors Untold. Horrors Untold by Matt Wilderson. Okay, let's say you signed with Cheezine. and. Yeah. The contract, they take your hardcover rights, your paperback rights, your ebook rights, your audio rights. Okay. Yep. So they don't publish the hardcover. They just bring out the paperback and the ebooks. You cannot take that book to another publisher and have them do a hardcover because cheesy and sitting on your rights. Right. Okay. And it, it was agreed in the contract that they would, in fact, publish a hardcover. Right. Which is a different clause than them. Whole, reserving the right to publish a hardcover at some date. Exactly. Right. Cheezine goes on to say, any other monies that Ed Kurtz might be due will be paid on his next royalty statement, which will be spring of 2020. Okay. Again, over a dozen. That's not one. That's not 12. It's over a dozen. Mm -hmm. And if, if I'm not giving you a general number, it's because I'm trying to protect a lot of people who are scared. Right. And we'll get to why they're scared a little later. OK, over a dozen authors reported late royalty statements or no statement at all. And the horror show has indeed confirmed that 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 is a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, one source told us that their last royalty statement from Cheezine was October of 2018. The year before that, they also got a royalty statement October of 2017. Uh, if. The next round of royalty statements aren't going out until spring of 2020. Then that means that cheesy and press authors would not have received a royalty statement or any money owed them for the entire calendar year of 2019. That is no right. way to run a, a, a an airline. No, <laughs> I mean, most publishers pay you quarterly. And even if it's a six month uh, a six month payment schedule that's still uh, the, the math still yeah. doesn't work out right um speaking of royalty statements the horror show has been given access to the royalty statements and financial records of multiple authors now while mary and matt and i are not accountants it is our opinion opinion that there is evidence of, at best, very sloppy bookkeeping, and at worst, financial malfeasance. Uh, royalty statements showed money held in reserve against returns, sometimes for as long as two years. Matt, do you understand what we mean when we yeah. say, yeah? Yeah, I'm picking up. Okay. I'm, I'm putting it down. I, I, <laughs> having you now in the engineer chair instead of Dave... You're like the new author that's listening to the show. So I look at you. If you understand what it means, then chances are new authors listening to the show understand what it no, means. No, I get you. All right. No, I understand. Two years is a long time. If if Barnes & Noble puts your book on the shelf, um, usually they're going to start returns within 90 days. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, now I've got a ton of mass market books over here. I've got small press books. The longest I've ever had money held in reserve for returns is a year. And that includes Bantam, that includes uh, McMillan, that includes even Leisure. Okay. Okay. And I just just as you know, for for new writers, that's one of the reasons why a contract, if it seems confusing, will usually say that your first royalty statement isn't until at least a six month to nine month period after the book uh, goes on sale, even right. if your royalty schedule is quarterly. Right. And that's because of the holding for reserve right. yeah. for returns. But the royalty statements from Cheezine that we have viewed, okay, and there are many of them, again, they show money held in reserve against returns sometimes for as long as two years. One royalty statement we viewed showed the correct advance one year 
let's say hypothetically it was five hundred dollars. Okay. Matt Cheesine published you, they gave you a five hundred dollar advance. It says that on your twenty seventeen royalty statement. Okay. The next year, the twenty eighteen royalty statement, it shows they paid you a seven hundred and fifty dollar advance. Well, that can't be right. Yeah, that's no. um and what's interesting about that, the difference in that advance seems to be have been used to justify the calculation that Cheezine didn't owe that author any money. Now, again, I'm not an accountant, <laughs> right? but I own a calculator. Oh, shit. Um, multiple royalty statements that we viewed referenced, quote, non-returnable retail. Okay. Now, it is my understanding and the understanding of the authors we spoke to that that means books sold hand to hand at conventions. Okay. Brett and Sandra did a lot of conventions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I myself bought books from them every time I saw them at Nikon because I like Cheezine's books. I like right. the authors they publish. Um, that's not uncommon. Just about every small press publisher hand sells books at conventions, etc. Right. Uh, it is our informed opinion, opinion, that the non-returnable retail figures represented on those authors' royalty statements are grossly underreported. In fact, we spoke to one author on condition of anonymity who kept count of the books they signed and sold at an event where Cheezine had a table. And the number reflected on their royalty statement did not match up with their personal count. As in, Jesus, it they, was under. As in, the, the number reported on the royalty statement was far below gotcha. what they counted signing and selling. Um, Cheezine goes on to say, and again, we're still on the statement day. We're still on the second the day of this whole yes. thing. Um, if any of our authors have any specific questions, whether regarding royalty statements or any other business related concerns, please contact us and we will do our best to provide answers in a timely fashion. This is incredibly disingenuous. A source tells the horror show they once heard Sandra complain about and belittle a cheesy author to a brand new cheesy author because the first author had dared to email Sandra asking where the royalty statements were. So, okay, Matt, you're at a convention. You've just signed with cheesy. Okay. Yay. (laughs) Mary's not at the convention, but she's had a book with cheesy for two years. Her, her child's tuition is due for college. She emails Sandra and says, Hey, any word on that missing royalty statement? And Sandra complains to you about Mary in this public setting. Okay. (laughs) Um, like I just, I just want to say first, like that whole response that you read off from them, that's just, that's the safest reply you can give to any sort of like problem that has mm-hmm. gotten uh, like awry in a public setting like or on twitter or whatever that's like the quintessential anybody who has a corporation will send out that ex- same oh yeah like, that was that coached ex- same thing yeah. yeah that's like copy and paste <laughs> from me, anything. it's my opinion that it was coached um it, and it's it's my opinion that the situation <laughs> that you brought up to a new writer would be intimidating yeah hell yes uh, as a new writer I would I would find it intimidating then to do what others have advised me to in standing up for my own rights and asking where my money is and following up on that stuff because I know how the publisher feels about inquiries. Right. So, you know, like I said, there's a lot of he said, she said, but we started digging into the facts. OK. And uh, some of the facts prove out Ed Kurtz's allegations as far as late payments, missing payments late royalty statements, missing royalty statements. Uh, And now we have this author who tells us that Sandra complained and belittled another cheesy author. Would that, in fact, establish that perhaps there's some truth to the allegations Ed made about them blacklisting people, harassing people? Well, let's continue. Uh, You know, we have this account of Sandra publicly complaining about an author asking for royalties. Uh, Ed Kurtz alleges that Sandra publicly called him a cunt. 
If only there were a way to verify whether that was factual or not. Oh, wait, there is. <laughs> but wait. Uh, author John Goodrich <laughs> is willing to go on the record. And he told us, quote, at the Nikon 39 Saturday lunch break, I was sitting near Sandra Kasturi. There were people around me, but I couldn't name them now. Brett was not there. Sandra said that Cheezine would soon be getting rid of their, quote, dead wood, referring to underperforming authors, and that the people who were talking about nonpayment were all, and I quote again, cunts. No names were mentioned, but I'd heard some of the accusations of nonpayment. I don't remember anyone replying, but I was pretty shocked and didn't participate in the conversation myself, end quote. All right, so. John confirms to us, while Sandra didn't say Ed Kurtz is a cunt. Right. Yeah, not directly, but she the the people uh, the people who were talking about nonpayment were quote cunts. Okay, and she didn't say this in a private setting. She didn't right. say this over email. This is important. Okay. Right. She wasn't venting to a therapist about right. it. Right. Ed Kurtz's peers his potential readers and other potential publishers were all ostensibly within earshot of this. This is inexcusable. Yeah. Inexcusable. It's childish. Late payments opinion. happen in this business. This is horse shit. Yeah. It also suggests to me, and this is my opinion, that if you are saying things like that, then you are, very much aware of people not getting oh, paid, yeah. so you can't say, "Oh, I, I you know, this was a problem that I, I, you'd it, have no reason I, to be angry if you were doing what you were supposed to be doing in the first place." Exactly, <laughs> but one can't claim ignorance of the situation if one is complaining about that situation. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's talk about this unprofessionalism. Multiple other authors and several former Cheezine staff members. And volunteers. Remember when they said Cheezine was a two-person two operation? operation? It's not. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, too. Only but several former Cheezine staff members and volunteers who spoke to us either off the record or on condition of anonymity alleged that they, too, had been victims of harassment and bullying at the hands of Sandra Kasturi and Brett Savory. Their experiences seemed to echo the allegations of Ed Kurtz. Uh, both Brett and Sandra used their private Facebook profiles to promote their books and authors. They didn't just use the Cheezine Press or Cheezine Publications Facebook. They used their own. Uh, two different authors shared concerns with us about that. According to one, quote, Brett was always posting really gross sexist memes and getting repeatedly banned as a result. I'm going to stop right there. I do, in fact, uh, because Brett was friends with me on my my private Facebook profile. Um, and I do remember him. He would often get banned and he'd come back with like a new name and send a new friend request. It was really weird. Um, but I never was like looking at his wall, so I didn't know what was going right, on. Right. Uh, so Brett was always posting really gross sexist memes and getting repeatedly banned as a result. Again, it was his personal account. And I would have had no issue with this if he had kept it totally separate from his job. But since he didn't, it was embarrassing to feel associated with it. End quote. Uh, we were then provided with several screenshots. I'm going to show you this one right here. If either one of you want to come over. Uh, Hold it's on. Brett Savory. And he posts a meme that says, Taylor Swift has 500 songs about guys leaving her and zero songs about blowjobs. See where I'm going with this now. I want him to sell my book. Yeah, look. <laughs> okay, we're we're not we're not a part of cancel culture on this show. Uh you know, I, I I'm a I'm a big believer that, that comedy should be beyond all that, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with what Brett posted in theory. But I agree with this author. I have a big problem with it if he's using that page to promote my book to the public, some right. of whom are absolutely and justifiably so going to be offended by that meme. I mean, you know, not for anything, but as I've told publishers in the past who said, if you sleep with me, I'll give you a contract. I keep pleasure separate from work. Yeah. You know, you, you, you can make your jokes, you can make your flirting comments, but not 
Not when we're talking business. Is that is that your advice to the young woman of today? When, yes. When the publisher tells them that, say no, I keep I keep my my business separate right. from pleasure, and you don't look like I you'd be very pleasurable. <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like you'd be very pleasurable. But seriously, um, that it should never be. There should never be that kind of overlap. You can you know you can flirt, you can have a good time, you can make little co- whatever. Like that doesn't. But if you're talking business with me, talk business. You know, don't don't equate oh, yeah. the two. That's We've not right. We used the word professionalism a couple of times, and right. that is not a definition of no. professionalism. No. Um, yeah. And if you're using an account to promote business things, then it should remain a business account. That's right. You know who's good at business? Who? USA Today bestselling author Robert Swartwood. Uh, his new novel, Endgame, Smooth. is up for pre-order right now. Kindle, Nook, Kobo iTunes and Google Play and the prequel to the trilogy, which is called Legion, is currently available for free on all of those platforms. Okay, so here's what we have so far. Dozens of authors alleging non-payment, late payment, incorrect royalty statements and missing royalty statements. Mm -hmm. The horror show has confirmed these allegations as fact. Multiple authors, many of whom spoke to us on condition of anonymity or off the record, uh, alleged harassment and bullying from cheesing. The horror show has confirmed some, but not all, of those allegations as fact. Um, what I want to do now is report on some of those allegations in more detail. Uh, I think what we'll start with first here is publicist Beverly Banbury. Uh, she worked for cheesing for years. And she alleges that during that time, she endured years and years of harassment and attacks on herself. But, Mary, I am losing my voice. Can you read Beverly's statement for me, please? Sure. All right. Let's switch seats. Okay. This is live radio here, folks. Don't trip over the cord. <laughs> this is how it all goes Do you, do you want to hold my microphone or do you want me to put it up here? Oh, my. <laughs> I'll hold your microphone. We should mention the new listeners. Mary and I are actually a, a romantically linked couple and live together. And right. we've we've been together what like a, almost a decade now, right? So yeah. that's not sexual harassment. I'm not her boss. I can ask her if you want to. I got this. Did you want to hold the microphone or put it up here? Um, no, that's fine. I can put do it here. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So here's here's the mouse. I I got this. Okay. Yeah. Just I got this. Statement. He's worried about me touching his stuff. I've got this. Okay. So this is a this is a direct statement from Beverly Bamberry. I have had my own full time on my own publicity business for about six years so far. It started when I worked for Cheesing Publications for a year and three months. It was mostly for no pay, which was my choice. At one point, they offered me a token amount of pay per book. But soon it appeared to me that they were struggling to afford that. So I, wanting to help and be supportive, said not to worry about the pay. They accepted my offer and I kept working for free. I now am convinced that they had a sense of entitlement and almost no appreciation for how much people did for them for little to no compensation out of the goodness of their hearts and how the core group at Cheesine abused people's goodness passion, and sincerity, but I am getting ahead of myself. I started with them because I was finishing a marketing degree later in life. I graduated with my BS. I was 39 years old. Being an older student, it was harder for me to find an internship that suited my life circumstances. As a huge fan of Cheesine's early efforts back in 2011, I talked to Sandra Casturi at a convention, and we both agreed that it would be a fabulous idea if I did an internship with them. I started doing publicity for some of their books not long after that. I did not at the time realize it is probably not a legal internship arrangement, but I don't think that would have changed my choice since I was new to the Toronto area and to Canada, and I had pretty much no friends in the area yet, and my career was late blooming. I loved working with the authors in the CZP fold, the bloggers and reviewers, and the local Toronto area community. Publicity was the perfect fit for my personality, and I seemed to be thriving to all outside observers. But increasingly, I was dealing with destabilizing, gaslighting behavior behind the scenes. 
Of course, it started out fine. Things were exciting. I felt like I belonged. But it quickly escalated into pressure to do a lot of work. I was gung-ho and let it slide because I have boundless energy when I am passionate. It took little time to continue to escalate into Sandra Kasturi primarily, uh, berating everything I did or said. Gaslighting in the sense that she would say I had done something I hadn't done or hadn't done things I had. Nothing I did was right. Absolutely nothing. I got to the point I was afraid to see her name in my email. Even though I was doing my best and was sincere and working hard for them and for their authors, nothing was good enough. Eventually, it got worse, with being literally physically ostracized at their events. They would keep my husband in, who they liked a lot, and who helped MC the Chi Series events in Toronto, and shoulder me out of the group. Brett Savory would put his chair between me and other people or hit me with nasty comments. Many times, I ended up having to sit at the back of the bar in which we held the reading series because they wouldn't let me near them, even though my husband was with them. At some point during all this, they fired me with a saccharine note about how we could be friends again if we weren't working together, though that was false because whenever I came around, it was obvious I wasn't wanted. It was middle school bully behavior, ignoring, sneering, rude comments. I forget the date and how it fits into things on the timeline, but my husband and I were having some troubles, as many marriages do, and even though things were bad with Sandra and Brett and me, in a moment of weakness and feeling isolated, I confessed the struggle I was having to Sandra. She can seem so warm when it suits her. She hugged me and comforted me, and I thought maybe things would, might be okay. I feel stupid and pathetic when I remember this now because I feel I should have known better after everything that transpired. Not much later, CZP author and very close confidant to Sandra, Michael Rowe, took my husband out to lunch and tried to get him to say bad things about me. My husband says Rowe turned the conversation towards this multiple times. My husband did not let the conversation go that way, naturally. It was very odd. Later, I heard from a very trusted source that Sandra, Brett, Michael, and others would sit around and talk about what a terrible person I was and try to plot to destroy my marriage and who they could hook my husband up with so they could, quote, keep my husband but get rid of me. They said I was ruining his life. Sandra shared my pain with others who then used it to betray me and try to further undermine my life. Think about it. They laughed at and enjoyed my pain and plotted to make it worse. I mean, at what point does something go from an ostensibly professional relationship to trying to destroy a marriage? By the way, I have heard directly from other affected person that we are not the only couple with which they tried this, but I cannot tell another person's story. There are other illustrative incidents but I won't include some of them because this is already so long and so much. All I ever did was work hard for ZZP, mostly for free. I was passionate about their authors and worked happily for them as their cheerleader. Sure, some campaigns went better than others, but given that I was working for no pay and at the same time finishing my degree, taking care of my family, and working a challenging full-time job, I did my very best. To this day, I don't know exactly why they twisted my motives so badly, but I accepted a long time ago that one doesn't create people's actions, can't control people's actions, and can't cure them. I remain hurt by people who turn their backs on me, preferring to stick by these toxic people, even though they knew what was happening. I can't tell you how many people I thought were my friends tried to minimize what I had gone through and then in some cases deserted me. Some of these people decried toxicity in the community and then turned around and let it slide with CZP. People thought CZP had something to offer them coolness-wise or career-wise. This is just human nature. I get it. But it sucks, and we can do better. I deserved better, and Ed Kurtz deserved better, and so many of us deserved better, and I am glad you're all finally listening. You make a fine Beverly Banbury, Mary San Giovanni. Well, I thank you. Thank you. If they ever make a movie, Beverly's Life. <laughs> I, 
and I'm making light not to be a smart ass folks, but because this is a heavy show. Okay. Um, Samantha Mary Biko. Samantha, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right or not. Uh, the odds are after five years on the air, probably I'm not. Probably not. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, who also worked for Jeez, Cheezine shared another horrific story. Uh, for the sake of runtime, because I, I see here we're getting a, a long show, uh, I'm just going to share part of it. Um, Samantha says, I worked for Cheezine Publications between the years of 2010, 2018. Likely the longest an outside contractor worked for Cheezine consistently. Uh, I am the silent third person in this two person operation, but obviously no longer. Uh, Samantha says, everything that has been said about the press is true, fundamentally. I've experienced it either first or second hand. I've heard how Cheezine speaks about the people affected. Uh, I can corroborate Ed Kurtz's experience because I was there as it happened. I was his editor, book designer, the person soliciting the quotes from the printer for the first, second, and subsequent printings. At least. Three printings. Ed Kurtz should have got paid a lot more. Right. Okay. Uh, that, excuse me, that wasn't Samantha. That was me interjecting. Um, let me go back to Samantha. I was his editor, book designer, the person soliciting the quotes from the printer for the first, second, and subsequent printings, the person tracking its numbers with the distributor as it continued to sell. But I quit in March 2018 for several reasons after years of taking it on the chin in every aspect you can imagine. Um, as I said, it's a lengthy post and I don't mean to make light of it. Um, but the fact is it confirms all right. of these allegations and so do the dozens and dozens of other public statements that have been made. Uh, some of them people sent to us to be shared and they, you know, they shared them on their own social media or websites. Uh, some didn't contact us at all. They just put it up on Facebook, whatever. Um, I'm not trying to lessen anybody's experience here mm -hmm. by not reading them on the air. I'm trying, trying to keep this concise. Okay. So that people will listen to the whole thing. If this is a three hour show, people are going to tune out at some point and they're not going to yeah. get all the information they need. OK, suffice to say, Samantha, who was inside right. at Cheesy, OK, who worked there from let me scroll back up 2010 to 2018, almost a decade. Uh, everything that has been said about the press is true. She experienced it either first or second hand. OK. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> it's it's, it's hard so not much to, to let it get under yeah, your own skin you know like, mm -hmm. so okay here we you know samantha's experience beverly's experience two more stories of clear-cut bullying and harassment uh while the horror show hasn't independently verified what samantha and beverly said right uh they certainly echo and match up with the incidents incidents of harassment and bullying that we have verified okay okay therefore it, it is it is our opinion right that these allegations are in in fact fact um another individual who spoke to us on condition of anonymity alleges that for years sandra would express an avid interest in publishing their manuscript then six to twelve months would go without hearing from her then she would reach out about it again apologizing for not getting back to this author, asking the author to resend the work because she'd lost it. The author would resend the work, hopeful all over again. Then another six to 12 months would pass, and then Sandra would contact them again from out of the blue, apologizing for taking so long and promising to get back with the decision soon. And then another six to 12 months would pass. Uh, the author would reach out, you know, hey, had a chance to look at that. Sandra would get back to him six to 12 months. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get back to you with a decision within a month. Okay. So it's just, it's a pattern, a pattern of this. Okay. And it's not just Sandra and Brett. Uh, there were some at Cheezine like Samantha and Beverly who got out. Mm -hmm. There were some at Cheezine 
who seem to revel in this this corporate atmosphere. Uh, Livia Llewellyn. Uh, disclaimer, Livia is a dear friend of both Mary and myself. Uh, now, you know, Cheezine had their webzine as well, the Cheezine webzine, okay? Right. Livia had a book come out called Engines of Desire. Oh, and it was reviewed on Cheezine, okay? <clears throat> Livia writes, quote, When Engines of Desire came out, Cheezine paid a reviewer to write it up. He, meaning the reviewer, compared the pages of the book to my labia, which as a reader, he could finger any time he wanted. In my opinion, how fucking dare you? Yeah. Right? <laughs> like... I was unable to verify if this reviewer was, in fact, Nicholas Pichone. But now, you know what? Nikki wouldn't pull that. He wouldn't. He, would, he wouldn't. Even, even he even wouldn't Nicholas do that. Nicholas Pichone has <laughs> he, more class than that. Even he wouldn't do that. Um, yeah. So to, to make this clear, okay, Livia has a book come out, Engines of Desire. Cheezine has a paid reviewer on staff, a, a reviewer. Apparently, this reviewer was getting paid, even though the authors weren't. A paid reviewer who compares the pages of the book to Livia's labia, which he can finger anytime he wanted. Okay, so this review gets published and people justifiably lose their shit. Okay, Livia goes on to say, quote, Sandra emailed me to say that the review would be modified, but that it was my fault for writing that kind of fiction. So I shouldn't have been surprised or angry and that I'd asked oh, for that kind of publicity, so I should be grateful. End quote. Fuck off. Like, how do you say something like that to somebody? How does like, a woman say that to another woman? Like, and Matt, you've been on the show for about a year. You've been listening for the yeah. full five years. How many news stories have we done where... A woman is being sexually harassed in this manner in this industry, and it, it's always, you know, as Mary always says, you know, women can talk to other women. If you're having this problem, come right. to us. Come to, you know, you or or, or one of the other elder states women. <laughs> and, you know, and here Livia does just that. Right. To her and own Sandra publisher, says, who is supposed to be. Well, no, not Livia's publisher, the publisher of this review. Oh, right, right. I'm you know, sorry, yes. She goes to Sandra and Sandra says, well, it's kind of your own fault for writing smut. It, it doesn't matter what the fuck you write. You should be it, getting a review yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm uh, sorry, but like, regardless of however attractive you find somebody to be or whatever, keep the shit in your own fucking pants and write an honest goddamn review. Right. right. Because right. again, fuck. you keep, you keep <laughs> the sexual... The sexuality toward the person and the sexuality toward the work separate. All right. Exactly. All right. So pleasure and business. Now, if you're if you're fast forwarding right now to get to the Stephen Jones part. Hi, you've, you've landed here. Um, that's coming up very soon, as is Michael Rowe and Cheshire Burke and all the other tangential things that happened. But here's the thing. OK, we've heard dozens and dozens and dozens of allegations to this point mm -hmm. who we haven't heard from is Brett and Sandra themselves. So, for the record, I reached out last Wednesday, the 6th. We are recording this show Monday, the 11th. There may be some things that happen that yeah. don't make it onto this week's show, and if you don't hear us talking about them, that's why, okay? Right. We're recording on the 11th. I reached out to Brett and Sandra on Wednesday, the 6th of November. Um, I'm going to read those emails verbatim. For me, sent on the 6th at 1046 in the morning. Hey, Brett, reaching out to you to let you know that a number of authors have contacted the horror show over the last week with allegations of non-payment, creative accounting, specifically monies held against returns for books that shipped to stores two years previously, bullying, etc. Obviously, we have to report on this. We made a group, group decision not to during the HWA thing because it appeared that everything had been resolved, but there's simply too many people talking about this now. We have to include it in next week's news coverage. I'm reaching out for two reasons. One, because you and I have known each other since 1998, and at the very least, I owe you a heads up. And two, I wanted to give you and Sandra a chance to present your side of the story. I've seen the public statement on Facebook regarding Ed Kurtz, late payments, etc. But is there anything else you'd like to add? Or does that pretty much sum it up? 
Do keep in mind, if your response is off the record, please let me know that, okay? Mm. Brian Keene. Sandra, Sandra responded to me at 12.07. Hi, Brian. We have to leave for a meeting very shortly, but we'll answer you as soon as we can, probably late tonight when we're off the road. I said, hi, guys. Roger that. I might not be able to get back to you until tomorrow. I've got Boy Scout stuff tonight, but I'll be there. Dungeon Master is very big in the Boy Scouts. Not yes. Um, then Sandra emails me back and says, uh, hey, Brian, sorry to get back to you so late. Have been in the hospital for the last seven hours. Is it possible to get back to you in the morning? Now, what struck me as odd is it hadn't been seven hours since they said, uh, you know, we have to leave for a meeting very shortly. At least right. according to the timestamps in my email inbox. Hmm. So, okay. You know, maybe the, this is a stressful situation. Maybe she had to go to the hospital. Or maybe the meeting was with you the know? doctor, you know. She could just is be it, spitballing is it, how is long it, it is, was. Is it possible to get back to me early in the morning? Sure it is. And I sent them some initial questions. Here are the right. initial questions. Number one, in your statement to Ed Kurtz, you say that you were approached by the HWA earlier this year. But multiple sources tell us Lisa Morton, then president of the HWA, approached you in 2018. Can you clarify? Number two, in your statement, you say that while we do our best to stay on top of the business, we occasionally fall short. Over 15 authors, some on the record and some of who wish to remain anonymous. And by the way, to clarify, this is this is like a week ago. At that time, it was over 15. It's an astronomical amount of authors right. now that have been right. reached out to us. Over 15 authors, some of the record and some who wish to remain anonymous, allege a systemic non-payment of royalties and not receiving royalty statements, some going back as five years. Can you comment on that? Number three, you state that Mr. Kurtz's next royalty statement and payment will be issued in spring 2020. Several authors state they haven't received a statement or payment since fall of 2018. If the next statements are going out in spring of 2020, does that mean no royalty statements or payment will have been made for 2019? Question number four for you, Sandra. We have multiple authors whom allege you have publicly slandered Cheezine Press authors in front of their peers. One source claims they overheard you telling a new CP CZP author that another CZP author was, quote, a bitch because they'd asked you for a royalty statement. Multiple sources state they heard you refer to Mr. Kurtz as, quote, a cunt within the earshot of his peers. And there are about a half dozen more who allege similar claims. Any comment? And question number five, multiple authors have brought up the optics of your vacation to Europe and buying a house while these issues existed. One source says that your mother paid for the trip and that Cheezine Press funds were not used. Any comment or clarification on that? I did not receive another response from Brett or Sandra. Shortly after sending those questions, Cheezine shut down their Facebook page and Brett shut down his Facebook profile. Uh, wow. Then this morning, as we're recording, the Cheezine Facebook page was brought live again, and the following was posted. Sandra Kasturi and Brett Savory have made the difficult decision to step down effective immediately from all publishing-related duties at Cheezine Publications. We know it's been a very hard week for all of Cheezine's stakeholders. The I'm faces a, and the palms. I'm, I'm trying to read this without interjecting, but you know what? <laughs> Fuck your stakeholders. It's been a hard goddamn week for your authors. Yeah. And, and for the readers of those authors. Um, but it's it's what been a, it's been a very hard week for all of Cheezing stakeholders. After discussions with key individuals, we have decided that the best solution for everyone concerned is for us to step back immediately. Christy Harkin has taken over as interim publisher. Miss Harkin has been involved with trade publishing for several decades. She will take care of author requests, status of books or contracts, requests to revert rights. I think she's going to be very bu busy in that regard. Yeah, she's mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of work ahead of her. Author copies and so on. Um, there will be a bookkeeper and accountant handling financial matters. Oh, well. Is that, this a new thing? That, Should that there might... always have been? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this uh, new? A separate person will be overseeing royalty statements and determining remaining payments owed. It's interesting here that that person is not named in this yeah. communique. Yes. Uh, Ms. Harkin will be working with the principals to ensure all parties are fully paid amounts that are due. It is important to us that we clear all outstanding arrears as soon as possible before the end of 2019 is a goal we feel can be met. I'm going to interject again. Ah, that's a nice goal. 
But we have a systemic pattern of Sandra and Brett setting goals and telling people what those goals are and not meeting them. So how is this any different? I mean, the, they, the, these new people that are taking the reins. Well, they don't say Miss Harkin feels this is a goal that can be bet. They say they say we feel this is a yeah, goal. Yeah, I'm can just be saying bad. though, since that's been stated, these new people that are taking the reins, if they want to prove themselves, better get this fucking goal met. Well, yeah. Like Yeah, they go on to say until the next not a lot of time. <laughs> until the next distributor check arrives, we've taken a short-term personal loan to bring payments up to date and to expedite the conclusion of this matter. End quote. One thing we didn't talk about a lot on today's show is the number of financial grants that Cheezine Publications receives from the Canadian government, uh, ostensibly, I guess, Canadian taxpayer money. That's because, as we said at the start of the show, we're not accountants here. I, I don't understand how grants work. You know, Mamatas keeps telling me I should apply for grant money. You have to send in a proposal, and they ha- and then granting bodies decide if they essentially want to and then what the government will pay me to sit out here in this office and mm-hmm. record podcasts it, yeah they do it i think they do it in what's, the uk at least in ireland i think they what's, do it what's the catch I like mean, what do they want to be supporting the arts they're supporting yeah. the arts which is an overall benefit to the society that that the artist is involved and in. they do this in the canada community. and the uk mm-hmm. why are we not living there we do have we do have available grants but generally speaking they're not for horror <laughs> Oh, no, at all. Oh, so when when somebody like Mama Toss or Paul Tremblay tells me that they're fucking with me because they no, just no, think it'll can... be funny that I'll I'll apply for the grant to write a, a zombie novel. It's not that they exclude horror, but generally the the grants are, are they're they're geared more toward um, what academia would consider more literary. Pursuits. What if I tell yeah. them I'm Nadia Bulkin or Victor Lavalley? Well, Can then, I then, then get maybe, the grant? Yeah. I mean, everybody loves Victor. <laughs> All right, well, then that's a, Victor, you don't care, right? Anyway, okay. Back to Sandra and Brett's statement. Um, you know, uh, their distributors are going to remain the same. Uh, Miss Harkin's priority is fulfilling all contractual obligations, including settling contracts with authors whose books are scheduled for release soon. Uh, ideally, cheesing publication authors who wish to can move forward with their work unencumbered. Okay, so that does not include any sort of apology. No. It does not address the harassment, the bullying, etc. Um, it acknowledges late payments. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, what do, what, what do we have here? We have factually confirmed non-payments, late payments, incorrect royalty statements, and missing royalty statements. Uh, we have factually confirmed harassment uh, and bullying. Um, you know, multiple allegations that money was mishandled and used to pay for vacations and residences and home expenses. We cannot independently confirm those allegations. So those will remain just that allegations. Um, as of this recording, dozens, dozens of authors are reporting that they have requested to have their rights reverted from cheesing immediately. Uh, and with that, we come to the opinion section of the show. We're going to get Mary's opinion. We're going to get Matt's opinion. We're going to get my opinion. And then we're going to get the Cheshire Burke versus Michael Rowe and Sanity versus Stephen Jones. <laughs> um, so, Mary, let's start with you. You're a veteran. You've seen this happen many times. I have. Let's get your If you are an author with a book of cheesing, what's your advice? Okay, here's my here's my opinion. I know that this business can be very difficult. I know that it is hard to find a publisher. It is hard to get that acceptance. It is it is hard to uh, feel like you're making any kind of headway in your career. But none of these things should be a reason to support somebody, uh, support a publisher who is not behaving professionally because whether or not this affects you directly, it will, it will eventually, I am telling you this from experience. Uh, when everything happened with leisure books, uh, the same thing happened. A lot of leisure authors who were afraid of being, I guess, homeless, you know, for lack of a better way to say it, were very critical of, uh, Brian and, and others bringing to light the idea that, uh, that leisure books was, uh, cheating us, basically. 
uh, that there was uh, many of the same problems, as Brian mentioned earlier in the show, with um, royalty statements being uh, incorrect, with payments not being made, with royalty statements not showing up at all. If a publisher is screwing any one of the authors, chances are that publisher is going to end up screwing all of the authors. You are not doing anyone a favor, including yourself, by backing unscrupulous publishers over fellow writers. The only way that we managed to make any kind of headway with the leisure situation was solidarity between writers. Exactly. That we, uh, we said we would not stand for this kind of treatment. It crossed multiple genres, and that was the only way things got fixed. The only way writers are not going to be the, the bottom of, you know, the bottom of the pile here in terms of, of people, you know, being treated professionally is if we demand professional treatment every step of the way, whether you're a new writer or a veteran writer. It doesn't mean you have to be an asshole. It doesn't mean you have to be confrontational or hostile, but it does mean that you have to stand up for your own rights. I know for a lot of groups of people, okay, across gender, across, uh, you know, race, across multiple lines, publishing is a business, okay? What it comes down to, you know, and this is not to minimize harassment, it's not to minimize, you know, sexual harassment or, or racial, you know, prejudice or anything like that but it is a business and uh publishers think in terms of money so why shouldn't you you know you can have friends in all different parts of the business but when it comes down to it it is a business okay that means that it should be a business for you as a writer you should if you are due money ask for it you know again you don't have to be an asshole but you do need to stay on top of those things, you know. Um, if you are a publisher, make sure that you have a plan in place that will allow you to keep paying the writers and, and the printers and everybody else what you owe them. You know, if you are having problems, be honest with writers about it, you know, because we all understand what it's like to be in a financial hole. Believe me, you know, uh, but I've one of the things I've come to understand as as a primarily full-time writer and in living with Brian and talking to him and talking to other, you know, professionals and just being around this long is that, you know, you are the best advocate for your financial security that's out there. So there is nothing wrong. You are not going to lose all possible. You're not going to be blackballed. You're not going to lose all possible chance of publishing anywhere else. The only thing you are doing by standing up for your rights and by letting other people know about corruption in, in any kind of publishing venue is that you're getting rid of people who are only going to hurt writers in the long run. Okay. You are not screwing yourself out of a career by standing up for your rights. That's my opinion. Good opinion. I agree thank with you, that. Thank you. I agree with Matt, that. you have anything to add? I mean, as somebody who's trying to get into this business, like when you come across something like this, it is kind of scary. Sure. Because you're just like, well, these are the people that I'm supposed to trust. Mm -hmm. And if this is what's going on. And it took, you know, it took a while for this to even come to light. Cause like you said, you were reporting on it about two years ago. You were going to report on it. So, you know, you wonder who the hell do you go to? And that's one thing I will say that came out of this that was very good is that, uh, Twitter and Facebook, it got shared around like all the presses that people say that are very trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was great because there were lists of independent presses that they're like, you know, if, right. this, if you guys want to get out of here, this is great places to go and everything. And that needs to happen more often, in my opinion, because all the people that are trying to get into this, they have, they have really no idea where to go. Right. You know, if I didn't know you guys, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't know a goddamn thing to do. Like right. I wouldn't know where to go. I don't even know who the hell to talk to. You know, so I feel like we should have more exposure like that from time to time. It's like, these are the places to go. You can trust right. these people. Right. Just Don't much, trust these right. people, you know. Which to me, I think also uh, negates this concept that, that some people seem to have that people are only dogpiling on cheesing and they're, they're only looking for a fight and that the only time, you know, they come out of the woodwork is so that they can basically destroy, you know, careers. Whatever. No, because, because one of the things people have made a, a, pointed effort to do like matt said 
is to bring up reputable publishers and to make sure that people know that like, hey, you know, these guys are doing it right. Yeah, we're and not we appreciate dogpiling that. or destroying shit. I read my personal emails to Brett and Sandra out loud here on the air. I gave them an opportunity yes, because, as I said, I've known Brett since 98. I wanted them to to tell me, yeah, you know what? It's, it's horse shit. It's a misunderstanding. Here's our side of the story. But there is no other side of the story. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, where are we at on time? Uh, we're at an hour. Now. An hour. All right. Yeah. A command decision. And my sincere apologies to both Cheshire Burke and Michael Rowe. I am friends of both of them. Um, I don't want to rush through that story. I feel I am doing both of them a disservice and our listeners a disservice if I do that. Okay. So I'm going to table that part of the discussion till next week because while it stemmed from this cheesing discussion, it's really a separate discussion, a separate issue. And yeah. just as important. And it's just as important. Yeah. Um, Chesha, Michael, I apologize. I, I promise you, I give you my word. We will open next week's show with that discussion. Okay. And I think it's a really important discussion. Uh, it's multifaceted, multi nuanced, and there's some sides of this thing that have not been expressed on social media. I think it's important that we take time to do it. All right. I agree. I do want to talk about Stephen Jones though, because I, I need to laugh. Um, but before we do, you know, Mary, you, you said it so well, I, I have nothing to add to that, but I'm going to say something now to Ed Kurtz. Um, actually, I'm not going to say something to Ed Kurtz. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open my email. I'm going to do something I never, ever, ever do. Uh, hang on. Let me find it here. Let me find it here. I was going to tease you. You you just left it wide open to so much teasing. Yeah, I like, know. But I'm going to do something I never, ever, ever do. What? Admit you're wrong? Oh! <laughs> I'm I'm gonna buy me flowers. Oh, <laughs> I was I was stalling for time because there was an important email coming in that I thought was related to this whole cheesing discussion, but it's not. Oh, okay. Um, and I got sidetracked looking. Um, love you, mean it. What it was was Gavin Dillinger fucking with me. <laughs> so, uh, with the subject line of cheesing, it had nothing to do with cheesing whatsoever. Gotcha. Um, I want to talk to Ed. All right, and the rest of y'all can listen in, but Ed, this this is for you. Um, when Leisure Books pulled exactly what Cheezine is now pulling, uh, I went through exactly, exactly mm -hmm. what you're going through right now. Uh, keep in mind, Leisure was America's oldest mass market paperback publisher. They pretty much were horror in the 2000s, yes. uh, and they owed hundreds of thousands of dollars to their authors, mm -hmm. also to a trucking company, to a paper mill. It wasn't just authors, but they owed hundreds of thousands of dollars. They owed me five figures. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I was their 28th biggest creditor. Yes. You know, yes. Out, of, out of the 30 biggest creditors, I was their, their 28th. Um, the scope was enormous. Yeah. Leisure's plan was to, quote, operate as if they filed bankruptcy without filing bankruptcy, end quote. Um, they intended what they wanted to do was sell the rights to all of our books. They wanted to sell the rights, the books they'd published without our consent. Mm -hmm. uh, if they had done that, none of us would have seen a dime. We wouldn't have controlled the rights to our books. You know, that's it. Uh, I went to one of the two biggest authors in the horror genre. I'm not going to say who on the air. Uh, and he told he was flabbergasted and he told me that, that he'd never in all his years in the business heard of a publisher trying to pull this particular move. Mm -hmm. um, and he said the only way to stop that would be to force them to file bankruptcy so that they'd have to revert our rights. And I said, how do you do that? And he said, well, I don't know either, but you're Brian Keene. I'm sure You'll you of all people <laughs> can figure it out. Um uh. So I got together with all the leisure authors, Ed, okay, not just horror, mm -hmm. but Western authors, mystery romance. authors, romance authors. The everyone. romance writers are feisty, too. Yeah, and, and Ed, <laughs> they are. let me tell you right now, at the time, everyone agreed, oh, we'll help you, Brian, you can count on my sword, okay? But when the war started, 
80% of those people vanished. They fucking mm -hmm. vanished. The public face of the resistance for her was me, Mary, Brian Smith, and JF Gonzalez. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Jesus. Now, there, I, there were mystery writers that jumped in, right. Western writers that jumped in, romance writers that jumped in, but a lot of other people vanished. Now, many of those people were friends. Um, they had their own reasons for not backing us publicly. Some of them had managed to privately secure their rights from leisure, but as a result of that, they had to sign non-disparagement clauses. They couldn't publicly disparage the company, okay? I respect that. I can that. respect that. They got their rights back. That's what we all want. I'm not going to mm -hmm. bear them a grudge over that. Some of them were advised by their agents not to help me, not to get involved. And I think it's worth pointing out that each and every one of those people, each and every one of them, no longer have those agents in the years that have followed. Exactly. Um, some of them, of course, had drank the leisure Kool-Aid and didn't think that leisure was capable of doing these things, that if we just give leisure a chance, mm -hmm. they'll write the ship. Well, leisure is going to publish my next novel and no one else will buy it. I'm going to stick by them. Okay. Or I don't want to piss off the, you know, biggest horror publisher. And yeah. And you know. Ed, guess what? I'm not naming those people because those people ain't in the business anymore. And it's not because we blacklisted them or bullied them. Mm -mm. It's because the rest of the family, the rest of the peer group saw, oh, okay, I see what that person's out for themselves. And that's it. All right. In the end, Ed, we won. Me, Mary, Brian Smith, Jesus, we won. Everybody got their rights back. The horror genre was saved. And then you know what I did to celebrate? I had a heart attack. And oh, Mary and I broke up for a year because of the stress we found ourselves in in the aftermath. My point is this. You have been through the same thing. I understand depression. I don't suffer from it from myself, but many people whom I love do. Um, I have been where you are at. You have fought a good fight, but do not let this shit wreck your health. Um, tell your depression you are not going to let it be Brian Keene's heart attack. You can be the Brian Keene of this generation. <laughs> you can say Brian Keene hey, fought for girl. his rights and I fought for mine, but but tell your depression that it is not Brian Keene's heart attack. And that's all I have to say. And I I wasn't intending to share any of that publicly, um, but I, I did share a little bit of it. Um it ain't easy being Batman, Ed. But uh, and there's many, many days where you will question the value of doing it. I was hoping to use this show as an opportunity to destroy the entire industry so that people would leave me alone. But I'm not doing that because at the end of the day, I care about this industry and I care about the people in it. And you do as well. Um, so, you know, peace to you. Peace to you, Ed Kurtz. Um, now. Let's talk about Stephen Jones, editor. As I said, Cheshire, Michael Rowe, we're going to get to them next week, I promise. Okay? Again, I'm not pushing their issue off to the side, but it's an important conversation to have. It's just as important as this, and I don't want it to get lost. Okay? But we do have to talk about Stephen Jones. Um, Stephen Jones, you know, he is, of course, the, I, I guess it's fair to say he's the Ellen Datlow of the UK, right? He yeah, is a, he uh, is just an esteemed editor in the UK as as Ellen is here. Um he is when when people talk about uh the old guard gatekeepers they're po talking about people like Stephen Jones. All right. So Stephen Jones, he goes on Facebook and he says, "Hello Mary Poppins." <laughs> is that what he sound like? Is that what he said? No, like? he says uh, I'm not going to do his accent. He says <laughs> he says I've never had a book published by Cheezine, but I've met Sandra Kasturi and Brett Savory on a number of occasions, and I know they are not crooks. Now, wait, I'm, wait, wait. <laughs> I'm not sure how one I've met lots of people at conventions over the year, but I don't know what they do in the bedroom. You know, K um, K -E -E. he says, <laughs> K -E -E. he says, which makes this week's tragic events all the more depressing. Once again, the social media lynch mobs. <laughs> Poor choice of words in 2019 yeah. are out baying for blood. Anybody's blood. I've also never met Ed Kurtz, and he may well have had a genuine complaint against cheesing publications for late non-payment of funds. However, 
In many similar incidences over the years, I have kept such discussions private and professional between the publisher and myself. I haven't whined about it on social media, and I don't buy into the whole holier-than-thou, we-should-be-warning-others mantra that I've also read online. And you know what? It usually gets sorted out to everybody's satisfaction. And if it doesn't, then there are other avenues you can take. Put a pin in that, please. Uh Here's this shit again. Didn't we report I'm not on- sure I have enough pins for all of the things that are wrong with Didn't that. Didn't we report on another thing recently where somebody came to light about something and they're like, well, why are you talking about this publicly? You shouldn't do that. And it's just right. like, why the yes. hell wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, he goes on to say publishing's a tough business. And small press publishing is a very tough business. He's right about that. Yes. I've been a small press publisher myself. And throughout my four-decade career, I've been published by many independent imprints and attempted to support them in the same way they've supported me. That's right. We are lucky. Lucky to have people like Sandra and Brett sacrificing their own time and money to publish books that enrich our genre and help give a boost to often new and upcoming writers and editors. And yes, Matt and I don't have enough pins. Yes, anymore. things sometimes do go wrong. Payments are late. Books never arrive. Royalties are delayed. That is simply the nature of small press publishing. After all, they are usually run by just one or two people, and let's face it, we know what we are getting into before we sign the contract. At least we should. CZP has published some remarkable books and some amazing authors over the years, and it hurts me to see how few of those people are coming out and standing up for them now. I, I can't I, read this with a straight I, face. I think I think I'm bleeding confetti out of my head. From so, this. Uh, you know, he's he goes on to say, I never had a book published by Cheezine, so I'm completely neutral when it comes to what's happened. But he's not. Yeah, he he's says, an editor. And he also admits, I probably don't know all the facts. Then why say anything until you do? Uh, you know, he says, Shit's making my head and my ass hurt. <laughs> yeah, it might he, just be the chair making he my just, ass hurt. He goes on <laughs> just stating so many incorrect things. Yeah. That yes. are factually incorrect. Yes. And I don't know if it's just because he didn't follow the story. Steven, do me a favor. Hit rewind and go back to the start of the show and just follow along. Okay. But you know what? You're right. You're right. These things should be handled professionally and privately to start with. No, nobody ever wants a big public three ring circus. So, Steven, right. let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of why sometimes handling things privately and professionally doesn't work. You published me in not one but two anthologies, the Mammoth Book of New Terror, which I'm holding up, and the Mammoth Book of Best New Horror, which I'm holding up. Now, the Mammoth Book of Best New Horror came out in 2005, 2005, and the Mammoth Book of, of New Terror came out in 2004 2004 2005 stephen jones published me in his anthologies so that's what 15 years ago stephen over the last 15 years i've sent a couple emails professionally and privately because i've only ever gotten one royalty payment for those anthologies and i've never gotten an actual royalty statement um and you know i've I agree it should be handled professionally and privately, but no one ever answers my emails. So I'm talking about it now on the show, okay? <laughs> because it's 2019 and that's how we do things. Right. Um. So, you know. You can't uh, just hope that silence is going to allow I people mean, to. You know, and, and quite frankly, stuff. at this point, I don't want the $40 or whatever the royalty, the royalty <laughs> is. Um, you know, cause I've resold those stories as reprints and then they've made me quite a bit of money and I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, but the point of the matter is this does not impact you. Okay. You don't have a dog in this race and no, Steven, you don't know all the facts, you know, and you talk about how everybody has to go on social media and bay for blood. Well, everybody also has to go on social media and offer their opinion on things they don't know shit about. So maybe you consider that before you excoriate these authors whose only crime is expecting their publisher to meet their contractual obligations. And that is my opinion. 
And that's all I have to say. One more time, this week's episode <laughs> has been brought to you by our good friends at AdamandEve.com. They are America's number one source for all things in the bedroom. They have stuff for her, stuff for him, stuff for couples. Uh, if you use my name, my last name, during checkout, up there in the offer code box, if you type in Keen, that's K-E-E-N-E, you will get 10 free tantalizing gifts, and they are shipped discreetly. The holidays are coming. Wouldn't you like to surprise your significant other oh, or oh, treat oh. yourself if you don't have a significant other? You can do so at adamandeve.com. <laughs> nice. uh, the holidays are coming. You might also consider buying the Man of Wax trilogy from USA Today bestselling author Robert Swartwood. The final book in that trilogy, Endgame, is currently up for pre-order on Kindle, Nook, Kobo, iTunes, and Google Play. And the prequel to the trilogy, Legion, is currently available as a free digital download on all of those platforms a reminder particularly if you're a new listener if you enjoyed this show there's some other things you might enjoy every week mary does a podcast called cosmic shenanigans where she examines cosmic horror beyond hp lovecraft matt does a podcast called grindcast where he examines video games and pop culture and i do a show every week along with christopher golden called defenders dialogue where we examine 1970s and 1980s marvel comics um you might want to come back and join us next week because as i said we're going to have richard chismar live here in the studio with us he's going to talk about his new novel gwendy's magic feather he's going to talk about cemetery dance he's going to talk about you know what it takes to run a small a successful small press um so tune in for that and as i said i promise you we will also talk about cheshire burke and michael rowe and all the aspects aspects of that story in detail we will give it the time it deserves um if you would like to advertise on the heart show contact our boss armand rose Amelia. you do it the same <laughs> way i did it at the start of the show, you can call them or you can go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com, click contact and just say, hey, Armand, I listened to the horror show for the first time this week because I wanted to hear Brian make fun of Stephen Jones. And, uh, you, you, and, and, you know, and the thing is, I liked and respected Stephen I Jones. I always had his anthologies you know, on my I, bucket list, I, but. I liked him up until he he said some really shitty things about Wrath James White. Uh, during the World Heart Toronto in the lead up to that. And I lost a lot of respect for him then. And what little bit I had pretty much went out the window this week with that. Um, but Stephen, if you would like to, to counter that, buy an ad on the show, just go to projectentertainmentnetwork.com, <laughs> tell Armand, I want to buy airtime to tell Brian Keene what a wanker he is. <laughs> He's a jackass um, McFuck face, yeah, damn it. You know, um, and yeah, that's all I got for this week, folks. And you guys got anything else? I don't know, I'm kind of spent. All right. I just want to say my my thoughts and my heart goes out to those that are affected by this whole cheesy thing. Absolutely. I hope you guys find a way out of it. I hope you guys find a new home that will you know treat you right and take care of your works and everything. So good luck. Absolutely. Exactly. All well right. Said. We'll see you next week, folks, with Richard Chismar. Bye. Bye. In a world where podcasts lurk around every corner. Listen, we just have to give the people what they want. Get it together. Authors Tim Meyer and Chad Scanlon invite you to an hour of sophisticated conversation. I just want to rip your d- head off for even saying that. Dude, I am just saying what you're thinking. From movies and TV to special guests, you name it, they've got it. I'd rather gouge my eyes out than watch that movie ever again. That's one of the finest movies of our generation. How are you both married? Join them every Wednesday exclusively from the Project Entertainment Network.